Hello everyone, inside and outside. Um, we're very happy to um, join today to a um, discussion and live stream with the title A Future for Food. And um, we are sitting here in Berlin in the Art Laboratory Berlin office in Berlin Kreuzberg. This is Chris, Chris de Lutz, and my name is Regina Rapp. And um, before we start, I'd like to introduce you to the speakers and to the discussion round that we are so obviously uh, very, very fond of that you all took the time and the engagement. The event today is um, one of several ones and it is sort of a collaboration between Art Laboratory Berlin and uh, the Network for Prototyping the Future. And uh, Amy and Ken are connected to that um, uh, initiative. And in the course of the next two hours, I'm sure we're going to find out more about that. Um, we have small presentations prepared about food and soil and uh, other um, issues. And um, the day is, um, the two hours should be very much um, uh, dedicated to uh, sustainable possibilities and new forms of um, um, symbiotic um, sustainable ways of living, co-living, co-creating life with uh, interspecies entanglements. And uh, food is essential today, soil is essential today. And it's basically also the question that we wanted to share for the next two hours is how can we overcome issues and current problems like desertification, water, or soil pollution, antibiotic resistance, climate change. I mean, really, really big themes. And uh, we are very glad that we have gathered such an interesting round of specialists that uh, I guess your audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all over the planet, that we can um, provide interesting food for thought. Um, the structure of our two hours uh, would be like this, um, after I introduce the speakers. Um, each of us has about seven, eight minutes of a, sort of a short presentation, uh, um, few projects or artistic positions that we would like to share with everyone. And after that, it will be probably a short hour and we will discuss in the round uh, that we are here. But uh, dear audience, we are very happy. And as we already suggested, you're very welcome to put questions either per email or on Facebook. And uh, we gather the questions and later on, we're gonna open up and uh, take your questions into our discussion. So before, um, I start my mini presentation. Let me please introduce um, the speakers. Um, I'm absolutely um, stunned and happy to see Amy, Amy Youngs here in our audience today in the speakers round. And I know Amy since uh, for two years now from this wonderful FEM meeting conference, uh, Women in Art, Science and Technology. And Amy absolutely is a very important person in that field. Uh, she's an associate professor in art and technology at Ohio State University and um, very key to her artistic practice and artist artistic research are is also like an interspecies approach that we probably will discuss in various projects later on and uh, very um, dear to you Amy are topics like electronics, kinetics, insects, plants, pixels, and I know that you have a special affinity and relationship with worms. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this later on. Um, then I'm very, very happy to see Ken, Ken Rinaldo in our round. Um, hello, Ken. And we are also um, welcoming you um, and uh, doing the speech uh, with you. And you're both uh, today from Columbus, Ohio, with us today. Uh, Ken, you are also a uh, professor of art and technology also at the Ohio State University. And uh, it is absolutely interesting to know um, your artistic practice 
that already has a big history behind. And it's not only the field of bio art, but all electronics art, um, post media art. You are very um, engaged in developing hybrid ecologies. And uh, I just quoted as you phrased it hybrid ecologies with humans, algorithms, plants, animals, bacterial cultures. So it's basically also similarly in a thinking of how artistically to engage in a multi species. Um, um, life or co co life basically. Um, also, very um, dear it for Chris and me to note is that our last exhibition at Art Laboratory Berlin, basically also before the pandemic closure of art spaces, was the exhibition um, um, "Borderless Bacteria: Colonialist Cash," and that was with um, really new artworks by Ken. And you can check everything out on our website. Maybe if you want, we can also touch that in our discussion later on. Then we are also very happy to have in our round uh, Anna Palziva from New York. And, um, and Anna uh, holds a PhD in Earth and Environmental Sciences at uh, CUNY Graduate Center in Research. You are very connected to the New York City Urban Soils Institute, and this is also what interests you. And I think the audience will also learn from you today about your approaches and um, methodologies and projects uh, also on urban soil, which I guess we are also very, very interested here. I hope the audience comes from all uh, rural urban background. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, we are very happy to welcome in our round here uh, Daniel Lamel, uh, originally from Brazil, uh, today um, with us here from Southwest in Berlin. So uh, Daniel is uh, at the moment here, he lives and works in Berlin as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Biology from the Free University. And uh, there's an emphasis on plant ecologies, and uh, we are very happy that we know Danielle for quite a while from our conference, Non-Human Agents, in 2017. And since then, he is also active uh, part in our art science group, DIY Hack the Panke, the river in Berlin Panke. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on. So I hope I was not too uh, thorough, uh, but it's very important to um, bring up to date our audience um, about the speakers. Um, uh, I said it, and um, so I, I'm going to start, we, we prepared a um, uh, um, uh, presentation uh, together, Chris and me, so let me share my screen with you, I have to have a little eye on this, watch, okay, uh, so please audience note questions. <laughs> Um, I'd like to invite you um, so is that can you see our screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, maybe you just have one picture and then you can see the whole screen. Perfect. Um, Chris and me want to quickly give a short pre in, in a presentation today and we want to dedicate to the issue of multi-species table. Um, so also like to, as a kind of tiny little introduction to our backgrounds, uh, if you are not familiar with Art Laboratory Berlin, this is uh, where we work. Chris and me, we co-founded it um, in 2006. And since then we are very dedicated to the field of art, science and technology. And this is also why we are doing this today uh, together um, with uh, Ken and Amy and with our guest uh, Anna and Danielle is that we have concentrated very much on the life sciences and the field that we also know with the term bio art or hybrid arts. Um, we had in the last few years an emphasis and from this series and concepts I'd like to quickly um, reflect about two artistic positions and Chris will take over with other artistic positions. So in the last few years, we were very much concentrating on what we call non-human subjectivities, 
uh, we later on had it then called non-human non -human agents. And the, the main aspect is basically the wish to decenter the human and to, 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 ha to create or to develop um, a very engaged worldview where it's um, interspecies entanglement, to, to quote um, Haraway, and to, to uh, show interesting artistic um, positions um, where we could also find an understatement of a sort of a post-humanism. So it is, uh, uh, certain people call, uh, call it the Anthropocene, but we are very critical with the term. So we would say um, in the post-Anthropocene world, uh, what can we learn as humans uh, when we decenter? What can we learn from animals, from microorganisms, um, starting with the microbiome and uh, uh, human uh, non-human entanglements and uh, animal machine behavior and uh, relationships. So we had a very series of uh, exhibitions and workshops and a conference. And uh, as you can see here in 2017, the conference also had a big emphasis on fungi and mycelia. And this is also something maybe we can touch today and I'd like to quickly elaborate a little bit in one of the positions. You can check everything online and all the 26 contributions of the conference, they're actually video recorded and you can, if you want, uh, you can um, check it out uh, later on. I'd like to um, bring into your attention an absolutely mind-blowing and very interesting artist, uh, Alana Lynch. She is originally from uh, Montreal, uh, from Canada, and uh, she now is based uh, and uh, she works and lives in Berlin. And she took part in our series, Non-Human Agents, in 2017. And uh, we, in, we invited her. And uh, this is actually also interesting with hybrid arts, that it is not uh, a classical exhibition or a classical talk. So she decided to make a performative lecture workshop. And as you can see in the image already, she's very interested in biomaterial. And um, so she has been growing the microorganisms that produce kombucha tea. And uh, through the process of fermentation, the symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast that we also know with the term SCOBY, it produces a cellulose material that is slimy and smells strongly while wet and can be dried and used as a textile. So you see that she also produced, what you see above in the image, she produced um, gloves or other um, objects out of the dried SCOBY. And we see her here in our exhibition space that she showed us um, the scobies and she, in her performance, she would hang it up and she would actually bring near the audience to, for a tactile experience. So there was a, I would call it, and I find it very interesting, a very multi-sensory approach uh, to smell, to touch, to, to feel, to really to be directly engaged with the material. Uh, also to quote uh, Karin Barat, um, who is very much uh, pleading to be uh, directly engaged with the biomaterial, actually, to understand it. So she presented uh, research in the form of a performative lecture and reflected the interdisciplinarity of the content. Also interesting is that uh, the fermentation, actually, it's a little bit like a on lifelong ongoing performance that she actually um, uses there kombucha also to, to heal her own guts. So actually the microbiome, and then with this, the, the gut, a brain axis, et cetera, you're probably familiar with that field, is uh, something that she explores um, autobiographically, then she opens up, it's like a knowledge sharing, but then also it's very interesting aesthetic performative approach, artistic approach to the field. So maybe if uh, that fits later on with other positions, maybe we can elaborate that further. Then I also would like to bring to your attention a very, very impressive position, an artist that you all should know if you haven't known her by now. It's uh, Sasha Spachal from Ljubljana. 
and we have worked with her since 2016. But I have to say that she works collaboratively. So she works in a collective with her partner, Miriam Schwagel, a microbiologist, and Anil Padgorn, like a computer science and scientist and programmer. And um, we were very, very happy in 2017 to have to had the possibility to present in Berlin the installation that you see here, um, My Connect. And the My Connect with a Y is exactly the connection between human and uh, fungal. So what you see is a work that involves creating interactive and inter, um, inter um, disciplinary situations of symbiosis between the fungal and the human. So it's um, an example in which a biofeedback loop is related between the human participant. You see here one person laying in the capsule and an oyster mushroom. You can see here the petri dishes inside and uh, there's oyster mycelium. Um, so it is an enc a special encounter which is mediated by non-linguistic forms of awareness and exchange. Sonic, electronic and also metabolic. And so in the installation, just to explain you a little bit uh, more, uh, here you have a detail on the right side of um, mycelium. Actually, fruiting bodies were already creating during the course of the eight uh, weeks of exhibition time. So the visitors are invited to individually engage in a biofeedback loop for about 10 minutes um, in an almost closed wooden capsule with Fungi. So in Berlin, they use oyster mushroom, but sometimes they also use uh, shiitake. Um, this involves connecting a person's nervous system to a fungal mycelium in a biofeedback loop. So the installation is what we could say a symbiotic connector of various kinds that questions the anthropocentric division between nature and humans. I think, and this is also um, a very crucial point that probably all of us today will touch. Um, I also want to quickly um, um, present you, and you can of course get more information um, uh, on our website. It's an ongoing project that Art Laboratory Berlin, Art Laboratory Berlin is involved with. It's Mind the Fungi, an art science project. Um, comes from the Technical University of Berlin, from our colleagues from the Institute of Biotechnology. And it is basically the idea of how to, and here's the sustainability factor coming in now, how is it possible to use tr fung local tree fungi for uh, as a sustainable material for the future? And we are very happy also we could bring in artists and designers and uh, you see here a walk and talk with Teresa Schubert, the artist and biotechnologist. So here it was a really interesting moment, also a citizen science moment of uh, foraging mushrooms and knowing them and coming from artists and science perspective. It was a really holistic approach. And then in the, later on to go into the labs and really cultivate the collected samples and actually now, which we find so fascinating, they are part, by, by large part, they, they make the stem collection. Here you just see a quick, uh, quick view to the exhibition that we managed to curate in the Futurium, a house of the future. We're gonna have a second exhibition now early July coming with the artistic outcome of the residencies with Teresa Schubert and Farah Peluso. And here I just wanted to quickly show you that we had um, also mushroom cultivation courses um, from top lab from our colleague Alessandro Volpato and this is interesting also they used even oyster mushrooms so basically the idea was really how to cultivate mushrooms at home like to cultivate your own food basically and it was not only a DIY but it was actually rather that we can call it a DIWO do it with others so that should be so far so good from my side and my hand over to, okay. to Chris Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to go back to a project we did ten, almost 10 years ago uh, with Alex Toland and Muriel Milicevic, uh, Wish Garden, uh, Wild Urban Offshoots. So uh, Alex is an artist who also, at the same time as she was making this work, was uh, finishing up a doctorate, a uh, dual doctorate between art and soil studies. And uh, with Muriel, they decided to take the neighborhood around uh, where our exhibition space is and discover a multi-species nutritional area. So there's a map on the wall 
that's actually uh, using the soil from the Berlin and Brandenburg areas uh, as pigment. And uh, it's a mapping of restaurants, stores, but also places where uh, insects or other animals might, you know, uh, green zones where they might get their uh, food also. And then another part of it was to uh, try to think of creative ways of either rewilding uh, north central Berlin or uh, discussing this exchange. And, uh, and it was not just a, 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 an exhibition, but there was a workshop part of it as well. So uh, the participants went out and explored the local area and came up with their own ideas for, uh, you know, kind of trying to make a multi-species uh, uh, nutritional community in the area. Uh, and, you know, here there are some images both from the exhibition, but also then here she's using mud to uh, uh, stencil uh, an image on the, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, then in 2014, as part of an exhibition uh, called Macrobiology's uh, Organisms, uh, one of the, it was uh, an exhibition with Brandon Balanchet and Maya Sprekar and Suzanne Anker. And we had this work here called Astroculture Shelf Life. And it comes from uh, uh, Suzanne's work actually with scientists who are dealing with the idea of agriculture in space. So how to make something, you know, an artificial agriculture and uh, she has this, you know, kind of LED. And it was interesting because uh, uh, we, uh, she was working with one of our interns at the time and had a whole set of instructions of how to take the plants and grow them from seed. And then uh, when they grew too big, then put, plant them in a, a traffic island uh, on the street uh, uh, adjacent to our space uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, so Suzanne is, you know, someone, she's certainly like really this, uh, pre-generation, like this art and science generation that kind of gives life to bio art. And, uh, uh, you know, this work here is a work that is all about this idea of technology and agriculture, uh, but in a, in, a, in a different way, in a possible future way. Uh, it was interesting because the, there's a connection between these two positions and that is uh, soiled in about a year after the exhibition, we were asked by Alex, who was writing a book uh, called From Field to Palette, uh, if we wanted to bring in an, uh, an artist and maybe an article or an interview. And we suggested an interview with Suzanne Anker, who was uh, with her students at SVA, uh, creating a project for the iGEM uh, competition uh, in, uh, at MI MIT, the International Genetically Engineered Machines. And it was a, a soil test. So, uh, you know, and so uh, basically uh, with her students and some outside uh, people in the uh, bio, young biologists, they created a test for toxins in the soil for urban gardens in New York. And they tried to do it in a way where the chemicals used in the test would be the least uh, obnoxious. Uh, and so, um, and yeah, so this was uh, here our interview uh, from that. Uh, text. And then more recently, we've been working with a, a group of artists and uh, scientists, including Daniel, in a project called DIY Hack the Panka. The Panka is this river, a uh, small river that goes through the, uh, the wedding uh, neighborhood. It's called the Wedding in uh, North Central Berlin, where our, our project space is located. And it's a tributary of the Spree, which is the river running through the center of Berlin. Uh, and it's something that's had an interesting history from uh, having been highly polluted 100 years ago. It was called the Stinkpanke at one point. Uh, there were a lot of tanneries to now being a, having kind of a green zone. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so here's uh, on the right, uh, India Mansour, who's a colleague of Daniel's. On the left, Sarah Hermanutz, who's an artist who's interested in wetlands. And they're uh, leading a workshop on, uh, uh, on the water but also it includes the soil, the sediment. Uh, here's something I think Danny was also involved with this project though in another uh, workshop with students uh, uh, with uh, the soil and the sediment uh, as well as on the water and what grows there. And yeah. And finally, I will uh, leave us here with a picture of a, a walk and talk. Um, with Daniel and, uh, uh, and Elliot Morrison, uh, which was on the, uh, the nitrogen and carbon cycles 
uh, it was a walk along the river and uh, talking about the science of, of, of the, uh, the soil and the water and how everything kind of you know, interacts into uh, a, a system of, of growth and life. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so I finish our presentation and I would like to continue, as we said, we would maybe just continue with presentation and then later on uh, have the possibility to open up a discussion. So I would like to hand, roll the ball over to Ken and uh, she might wanna um, share with us the presentation. Okay, did, um, okay, so I guess I say share screen. Share screen. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to begin just by mentioning what the Network for Prototyping the Future is. And this is a collaborative organization that's founded by Amy Youngs and myself. And the Network for Prototyping the Future uh, fosters understanding and approaches to becoming better collaborators with the flourishing of all species. We work with creative leaders in the arts, culture, and sciences to invent, critique, and direct social conversations and action surrounding ways human cultures can better acknowledge ecological issues. Now, some of the works that you'll see today are actually uh, coming directly out of the Network for Prototyping the Future. Some of them are collaborative and some of them are individual works. I'm beginning my talk today by thinking about food systems and collaborations with soil, water, worms, fish, bacteria, fungi, machines, and multi-species humans, because in fact, we are a multi-species uh, being. I began my experiments really when thinking about food really in graduate school and it, it occurred with a work called I Am What I Am, constructed of yams and potatoes. And I saw this as a living system sculpture, a sculpture that you could interact with. What I didn't expect is that during the opening, people actually ran up and took bites out of the potatoes. And they were also given stones to throw directly at the work uh, in order to activate paint that was suspended inside egg. And this dripped into the field. Uh, of the uh, potatoes and yams. Later, the work was turned over to slugs and worms where they consumed it until it was gone. Uh, this work basically introduced me to the idea of a living system sculpture, uh, even though as an undergraduate, that's what I was studying, which was living systems theory with James Greer Miller. This was the first time I felt like I had actualized a work of interactive art that involved not only the stomach and eating, but interaction and eating of worms and slugs, as I said, until the work was done. But a lot of my work is interested in emulation and thinking about how we might emulate and think about natural living systems. This is an early collaborative project with Mark Grossman, and it was uh, intended and did function as a work of uh, robotic sculpture that flocked towards sound. And it basically is in a field of artificial life and uses natural materials. And I was interested in looking at the wisdom of plants uh, in their ability not only to find sun and water, but also to see if that could be replicated in an artificial life system. My first exposure, in fact, to worms was tube effects worms. When I was thinking about and looking at flocking systems in general, I came upon these tube effects worms and realized that the structures they were exhibiting were very much like roots or like brain cells or like circuit boards. So I created a work called Technology Recapitulates Phylogeny, which was intended to basically juxtapose the primordial intelligent forms of the universe, that being tree structures. When you entered the space, uh, a light came on and then projected their supra organization onto the ceiling. And this was a work really that was about looking and trying to understand the wisdom of living systems and working together and collabor collaboratively. As I was looking at the worms, I became very interested in fish, specifically Siamese fighting fish. I went into a store and I found a little glass of water and in the glass of water was a little Siamese fighting fish. And I thought, wait, uh, that, if I was that fish, what would I want to do? Clearly, I would want to drive the tank around. So, what I designed was the very first robotic fish tank designed to give fish 
uh, the control of their robots to interact in the space, but also to create a completely integrated uh, ecosystem where the fish were happy, where they were getting uh, nutrients from the plants, oxygen from the plants. This was an ecosystem. This led on to some really wonderful conversations with my, uh, my collaborator, Amy Youngs, and my wife. And from there, we had a very wonderful invitation to create a work of art for the Te Papa Museum. We were very fortunate to receive a commission from the Te Papa Museum to create a work of art uh, surrounding the production of food. And we created this project called the Farm Fountain. And I think I'm going to air a little bit of video from that now. Farm Fountain is a sculpture for growing edible and ornamental fish and plants in a constructed indoor ecosystem. Based on the concept of aquaponics, this hanging garden uses a pump along with gravity to flow the nutrients from fish waste through the plant roots. The plants and bacteria in the system serve to cleanse and purify the water for the fish. This project is an exploration of local, sustainable agriculture and recycling. As we researched this work, we were astonished to learn that our food travels an average of 1,500 miles from farm to fork. So we originally developed our custom aquaponic system as a way to grow fresh food in our home, even in the winter. The system recycles two liter plastic bottles as planters and continuously cycles the water in the system to create a symbiotic relationship between edible plants, fish, and humans. Every four minutes, we pump the water from the bottom of the fish tank through clear tubing, leading to the top tier of the bottles, where gravity takes over and the water cascades through each of the bottles, emptying into the main fish tank. This 250 gallon tank is separated into two zones. At the top where the fish reside, we constantly filter the suspended solids in the water to keep it clear. This bottom zone is where the water is drawn up and pumped to the top of the plant containers. Each planter contains hydrogen balls, a hydroponics media made of clay. As the waste-laden water enters the hydrogen balls, the natural nitrogen cycle is allowed to take its course, establishing colonies of nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. This process converts the toxic ammonia in fish waste into beneficial nitrogen compounds that are then absorbed by the plants as fertilizer. The work creates an indoor, healthy environment that also provides oxygen and light to the humans moving through the space. The sound of water trickling through the plant containers creates a peaceful, relaxing waterfall. The fish that are a part of this project also provide a focus for relaxed viewing. The plants we are currently growing include lettuces, microgreens, cilantro, mint, basil, chives, parsley, rosemary, and curry. In other versions of this work, we are growing tilapia fish, which are edible and delicious. Many varieties of fish can be grown in this way, including perch, crayfish, and goldfish, which are seen in this version. Each grow light is a low power LED bulb, which only uses four watts of energy. So our complete lighting system with 100 bulbs allows the possibility of powering the system with solar panels. The bulbs are specific frequencies providing the light spectrum the plants need to flourish. We are interested in the potential to inspire others to make their own version of the farm fountain. So we created an illustrated how-to page online to share our designs. We hope others will join this dialogue and help evolve the possibilities for local indoor aquaculture. One of the challenges that uh, Amy and I discovered in the uh, implementation of that project, of course, was that most of the food that we were feeding the fish was in fact coming from fish food, specifically from the ocean. That made Amy and I very sad. We were also sad that the system had to use power. 
we were very honored to receive uh, an invitation actually from Marta de Menichas at Cultivamos Cultura to do our very first solar farm found. And this was one basically powered by solar power uh, and also had some fish below. But the work turned out to be quite complex to maintain, uh, not only the one that we put into our home, but also the larger system. And Amy and I at that point, I think, went off and started in different directions, looking at alternatives of not only how to produce alternative sources for food, things like uh, worms or soldier flies, but also alternative places that would involve soil. These are my Cascading Gardens urban grow bags, and they're specifically designed for urban spaces to hang in uncontested urban environments between buildings and to harvest vertical sunlight that exists between buildings as well. The bags trickle into a large worm bag where food scraps are recycled, and then water is pumped to the top of the system via a, a solar powered pump, basically. And I'm growing leafy greens. These bags, regretfully, were far too large. It was a little bit difficult to reach them, requiring a ladder. So at that point, I designed a much smaller bag and thought of them really as a way to distribute uh, and get these out there into people's environment. My hope was really to inspire people to think about uh, urban gardening as a way to feed themselves and to become more reliant on their own abilities to grow food, but also their abilities to reprocess waste. I was thinking of these as along fences. I wanted to spur conversations between neighbors. But the works also presented a lot of challenges, specifically in the Northeast or in Columbus, Ohio. We have amazing amounts of squirrels and squirrels were always digging in the bags and making it very difficult to present and create a, a very strong harvest. But these are also uh, urban grow bags that exist inside. This was one at the Knowlton School of Architecture in Columbus, Ohio. This is one uh, in Ekaterinburg, Russia, uh, where the work was commissioned by the National Center for Contemporary Art. And this was one that was built in the Antonio Prates Gallery. The works have become perhaps less grow bags for vegetables and perhaps more oxygen providing and beautiful flower providing environments for galleries and indoor spaces. I'd like to end my talk just by saying, often hunger unites the predator with the prey or the mouth with the photosynthetic bacterium or the algal victim. And symbiogenesis brings together unlike individuals to make large and more complex entities. And I challenge, and that's by Lynn Margolis, really one of my great heroes. I challenge everybody uh, who's listening today to do what you can locally to become a part of this task and how we're going to feed everybody. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, I can now. Yeah. Go. Very much, Ken. That was really brilliant, and this brings us a lot of uh, interesting thoughts and uh, food for thought. And we're going to come to that later on. So I'd like to roll over the ball to Amy. Yay! Um, Thank you for having me. This is um, exciting to be in conversation with you all about a future for food and um, and to also share this sort of presentation with Ken because you'll see there are many um, interweaving conversations that we have as artists. Um, and, and one of the things I think that we all share here is this, and many of us know that this industrialized um, nation's system of food is is really not sustainable and also not equitable. So, you know, we're really thinking about how can we how can we change this um, and what can we do as artists and scientists to sort of move that dialogue. And so, as an artist, I'm really trying to explore what else is possible. Um, you know, what if we really took a look at the invisible labor that's being um, exploited often, uh, people, places, animals, insects, the microbial communities that are a part of our food system. And what if we were instead motivated by a kind of an ethic of belonging, 
to a flourishing living world. And I think that's something that we, we probably share. And so how do we then share that more broadly? Um, can we situate our human selves and in a way our minds and our bodies inside of the multi-species food webs that we all rely on? So the way I work as an artist is to approach these questions by creating small scale ecosystem artworks that, that I share space with, participate in through maintenance and care. And I think those things are quite important. Um, and uh, we'll, especially uh, as Ken has mentioned too, so, all right. So um, the first project I'm gonna show is Digestive Table. Um, because eating is where we take the non-human parts of our world, everything that we don't consider to be us, and we put them in our bodies and transform it into stuff that, that we do think of, of us. And um, this project is addressing another important part of this food system that we're also participating in, um, but that we often forget about, and that's the food waste processing and nutrient recycling. So a worm composting funnel is built into this table. Uh, and the food waste can be discarded in this portal at the top. And the worm colony digests alongside of the human eating, um, and the human can observe, contemplate the connections. Um, they can also feed the worms, and there's a closed system sur uh, surveillance, closed circuit television system that um, images those, wor those worms and the isopods in real time so that you can watch them and, and contemplate the connections. Um, you can also uh, get the compost out of the bottom of the worm funnel and feed it to um, your plants. And so the, the worms have been part of my and Ken's household for 25 years, and they've changed how we eat, what we buy, and how we think about our relationships with non-humans. <clears throat> the categories that um, are used to describe our relationships with non-humans, I think are quite inadequate. So we have things like pets, food, labor, entertainment, sports. Um, I, I just think that that's not enough, you know, and worms have really helped to teach me about a wider range of sustained relationships that we have with non-humans. So the rich fertilizer that they create for us is fed to our garden plants, which then helps our plants grow into herbs and tomatoes that we eat. They eventually become integrated into our bodies. Um, the plant clippings and veggie scraps go back into the worm bin. They cycle back into nutrients. Um, so here we're caring for the worms not like pets but as if they're part of our extended bodies because they are um, and here I'm thinking about worm care as self-care and also earth care both. So building a rainbow is a project that um, that is like a continued experiment with um, worm ecosystems and sort of a combination of aquaponics with vermaponics, which is kind of like hydroponics, except that um, instead of having to feed it with petrochemicals, um, we're able to actually use worms instead to prov provide the nutrients um, for the plants. So it disconnects from the problems of um, uh, petro based chemical fertilizers. In this project, um, the materials were sourced from local thrift stores in Cleveland, Ohio, where I had this residency. Um, the water is popped up, pumped up to the top of this sort of rainbow and sort of percolates down through the plant, so it circulates the nutrients through the water. Um, I think of the um, bottom parts as pots of gold where the wheatgrass grows. The worms are living underneath those wheatgrass lids. So you just simply lift them up, put your food waste there. Um, the worms do their work and the nutrients circulate around. So you don't have to like move the soil around or anything. The, nu the nutrients um, go around and the worms don't drown contrary to popular um, thought, worms actually uh, do just fine in oxygenated water. If you think about it, when they're underground, they don't suffocate either. They're, they're just fine. Um, so in another version of this um, idea, I've taken the system off grid and used a solar powered pump and a timer. I was thinking about the system of rivers here, in particular, how the nutrients flow through and how life can flourish. So plants are eating the sunlight, the, um, and the minerals. Animals are like eating the plants and the waste from the animals and the plants are flowing 
into the river and they're transformed by organisms like the, the worms, the fish, the bacteria, and then those nutrients go on to feed the plants and so on. So river construct is an extremely simplified river system. Um, and a rabbit lived there as part of this ecosystem, providing a focus of empathy and care for the humans, um, but also providing nutrients that would be swept up then <clears throat> and fed to the worms. So um, the worms lived in these red buckets that were hanging from the ladder that were like the, um, the nutrient pods. And people could feed the worms. Um, they could pet the rabbits. Um, they could put the rabbit poop into the buckets. Uh, mostly it was the gallery guards who did this. Um, uh, and the worms then did the nutrient uh, uh, processing with the bacteria. Um, and this system was really meant for human interaction. I really wanted to get people engaged in the um, care and feeding and eating so they could eat the basil and the, um, and the, and the plant, plants that came out of the tomato plants. Um, because I've really wanted to think about the ongoing entanglement of care. But I don't know if this really works well for a gallery situation because the people visiting aren't necessarily the ones that are doing the ongoing care. It's more like me or the gallery guard. So I'm not sure, you know, for me, I then decided that I wanted to have something that was a little bit more about how people could have hands on home care experiences with worms. So my next project is Worm Cozies, which <clears throat> were designed to help humans feel more comfortable with hosting worms in their homes. So based on the kind of the concept of appliance cozies, those furry things that in the 50s were used to hide the garish look of appliances, these machines that entered the kitchen that seemed so garish, you know? Um, so in a similar idea, you know, the idea of having worms might seem um, conceptually terrifying in your kitchen, but in fact is fine. So this is a kind of a, a softening interface that helps us get used to the idea of living with worm ecosystems. And I really use that word to also include the bacteria, the fungi, the isopods, and the springtails, all of that that is growing. Um, I think of the worms as more like the characters <laughs> that, we, that we can see more easily. Um, this project also included a kind of um, several workshops that I did with people, which I think is a theme that we're, that we're noticing here, um, having workshops with people in a way to help them also engage in their own hands-on care and feeding of ecosystems. Um, and I also I was thinking about what the worms would want, and I, I don't know exactly, obviously none of us do, but I would imagine like most life, worms want to um, go forth and flourish and repopulate. And so this also lets me give the worms new homes, new territories to expand into, um, into these new people's homes, because I would just uh, partition off parts of my worm colony and give it to them. And the last project I'm gonna show is a collaborative that Ken Ronaldo and I did together. Um, and this was created during a residency at the University of Maine. We built it with the students there, and it is still there in the lobby of their art building, permanently, hopefully, as long as the um, students and the staff will care for it. So there's a student-run coffee shop there that we um, were interested in because it provided a waste stream of um, coffee grounds, which worms love. So um, they, the students would then put that into the top of the worm hive, which is the thing with the blue smurf hat there and they would they would feed that the waste and um, and the the system circulates around there's a pump that pumps the water up to the top it circulates through um, these plants the worms also can circulate through the tubes into the plants <clears throat> and this was an experiment that's uh, that is so far still working um, the students are able to reprogram the arduino timer there based on different times of the year the um, heating and air conditioning, uh, it's drier or hotter or colder, so they need to change the cycling. They're continually upgrading this with different kinds of sensors to make the system more responsive. Um, so that was something that we, we felt was um, a real success because we're engaging this other community in the care and feeding, which I think is really something that um, we're realizing is the important part of change. Um, 
So I'm ending with this, this hypothesis that if more humans participate in the care of the multi-species beings who are a part of our food systems, we will create more equitable systems together. So I put that out there with hopes that that may be true. And I end, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really brilliant. And um, it was a lot of inspiration. Fantastic. Uh, let us go on. So, Anna, if you want to share some of your project with us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm learning so much. I, I knew Ken and Amy since we met last year, actually, as a part of uh, artistic collaboration. And I was uh, on the governor's island in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, in, in New York. And uh, it's uh, typically it's for artists. And it was, it was really interesting to be part of this uh, artistic collaboration. And when the guard would ask me, because you need to take a ferry, it's like, who am I? I'm like, I'm a soil artist. It's like, am I? <laughs> like, like what? I, I was a part of this artistic uh, initiation that was, um, it's a swale house. Um, in uh, Governance Island, and it's really fascinating um, collaboration. And if you ever in New York, anyone should do it and visit uh, Governance Island and see all this amazing art, um, artist art, artwork on Governance Island. And uh, uh, every house there has different meaning, uh, different projects. So we had um, uh, really in our artwork was related to um, soil. And my research as a scientist uh, in collaboration with my uh, friend who is a soul artist. So I will show you in a second what we did. But my journey started uh, uh, from a really early earth, uh, early, early earth, from the earth, definitely. From, um, oh, wait, did I share it with you? No. Did I? You can see it, right? Okay, good. Um, uh, it started from an early um, age because I grew up in the countryside in, uh, in Russia, in South Russia, and I think it's important to have this map. I like to put my presentation to show because um, that's where love for agriculture and soil um, came for me because it, this uh, south of Russia is really fertile soil. It's uh, chernoziums, it's black soil. Uh, it's, um, it's productive and we can grow practically anything as you can see on this uh, few videos. Um, I uh, grew up in a family of agronomy, so I knew from a very early age how to take care of plants and grow your own uh, produce um, very healthy. And since I, I grew up in this very clean environment, I am um, uh, very sensitive to the flavors of the food. And I've noticed since I live in New York for the last nine years that uh, the food we buy here is not always uh, the same flavor. And my mission today is actually um, share these experiences that I grew up with uh, so others uh, also will know what a real food uh, uh, tastes like. And, um, and by real food, I mean the gr uh, that grew in a healthy soil, uh, properly maintained uh, and uh, contaminant free. Uh, and I have do it through my research uh, at the Brooklyn College is um, our main uh, campus is um, we have a lab. So a lot of testing and a lot of work was associated with this campus and a lot of people send their soils to us. So I found this uh, really great um, soil hub in New York. And my uh, questions were always, uh, how can we grow healthy produce in a polluted environment? What do we need to do to, do to protect ourselves, and especially children, uh, from contaminant exposure? And how can we shift towards sustainable practices? Because as we all know, food is not always produced in the proper way um, and not always sustainable. And I was really fascinated uh, to see this vertical gardens by uh, Ken and Amy. I even made a note. It's, um, I'll have to go back and see uh, more of those photos. It's really, really beautiful and, and functional, which is super important for urban environments that are very contaminated as we are in New York. And uh, we uh, uh, created this um, collaboration with Donald uh, Dow Dallas that I mentioned in Governance Island last year, and uh, he uh, he's an artist who um, 
creates um, one of his projects is to create this uh, compost that you can see on this uh, right corner. Uh, it's a bone, it's actually bones of invasive species carp that can be um, uh, captured from Illinois River, that is where it's invasive, and then uh, through his uh, artistic approach, which very uh, functional using soldier flies, he was able to get these uh, bones that are enriched in phosphorus that I can use uh, to treat uh, contaminated soil, this lead. And you can see here, we had the part of our exhibition was to show different sources of lead that we have in our household and different ways how lead can be treated in the soil to make our produce healthy and um, uh, more or less sustainable. So uh, that was really um, interesting uh, experience in this uh, collaboration. For me, it was very, very new, unique. And another project that I want to bring attention is created also in this whale house. It's a permanent uh, residence of New York City soil exhibition as part of the how, um, urban soil room and created by Margaret Boozer, who is the director of Red uh, Dirt in, um, uh, in Maryland. Uh, she's also um, Art Extension Director of New York City Urban Soil Institute, which uh, hosted this uh, exhibition. And you can see here, uh, she uh, created this really awesome uh, soil profiles from all five boroughs from New York in collaboration with soil scientists from the US Department of Agriculture. Um, some of the photos are here. And uh, I think this is the way how people can connect uh, because they come and they don't know how what to expect and then they don't even know what's under their feet. But uh, this is uh, the way to reconnect and uh, be more engaged. Uh, I think it's by looking and uh, touching uh, some materials. Of course, this is the exhibition, so they cannot touch it, but people are fascinated when they see this. And I heard them, I was like, oh my God, really? This? Oh, let's see where we live. And they look in the map and they look in the soil and they find something that they never saw before. And this is also very educational. So I think we bring science uh, to people through artistic and edu educational approaches, we can create much healthier environment and ev eventually um, healthier produce because people will actually have understanding what they're doing. But um, it's uh, very hard sometimes to uh, connect um, uh, the science uh, to people. And this is actually, I got this um, quote from Amy, um, in the, um, urban gardening is in a citizen, um, um, artist or uh, scientist um, uh, approach or project. So I think if a uh, public um, build more engaged and uh, they do the share their monitor soil monitoring uh, results. So a lot of people send their soil samples to laboratories like in our case, Brooklyn College. And, uh, but there are plenty of other different places where they can send it to test or even test themselves and they can share, then we can have a better control of uh, soil pollution and know where we need to remediate. But very often, actually for the most part, scientists don't have access to people's home yards. It's unless a person wants to test, we will not be able to test for them. And uh, this is where we need really a, sci a citizen science involvement in so-called citizen science project where uh, residents of the city work hand in hand with scientists and report their findings on soil quality so we can have a more comprehensive idea of what's going on in the city, find the hotspots, remediate them and have a better uh, produce and also eliminate the exposure of um, uh, children to this uh, contaminant. Uh, we do a lot of uh, activities in uh, New York and this was a part of uh, New York City Urban Soil, uh, Soil Institute outreach program. We uh, did this uh, really interesting workshop outside in, uh, in Brooklyn McCartan Park and with Columbia University uh, colleagues and uh, the kids, you see, they were really curious to look in the microscope and see what was going on. And it's actually something like um, uh, Regina mentioned before, directly engaging with the biomaterial to understand it. And, um, and that's, 
I guess that's what exactly they did. And people were able to bring their soil samples. You see me testing it for contaminants with the X-ray fluorescent analyzer that is portable. Within 30 seconds, it can give results of concentration of heavy metals. And we'll be able to tell people right away uh, what's uh, in their soil and uh, advise them what to do, what they can grow, what they shouldn't grow, and how to remediate it. And uh, I think having more projects like that will bring people's attention um, and educate them uh, as well. So to conclude, I believe in collaborations between artists and scientists. Uh, and I think together we uh, can shift the paradigm towards better food futures. If we work together in response to mitigating soil pollution and adapting best management practices, we can provide a cleaner and more sustainable environment for ourselves and future generations. Thank you. Very much. Uh, that was really mind blowing. We could learn a lot. Wonderful. So um, I'd like to continue then directly and uh, roll over the ball to Danielle um, for our last presentation um, before um, we can come to our um, collective discussion then. So. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a very nice talk and nice to meet you, all of you. I just knew your projects by the websites and they look wonderful. And it's much more interesting to, to hear for you, from you about them. So I am a soil scientist and I will talk a little bit about also the works that we are doing here. And when I was invited to, to have this conversation, it was mentioned these three big questions. So I guided my presentation more or less to try to answer these questions. In, in seven minutes. So, of course, it's not like a very deep conversation about them, but I will try to give some insights about our experience with this subject. So, the first question, uh, can we break away from current agriculture? And this is a very big question. And of course, there are a lot of discussion about this. And when we think about our lives in, in this series, I think we have some challenges to think about how to solve these, these questions. So I share with Anya that my grandfather was farmer too. So I am happy and lucky that we, I can have like both sides. I always live in, in the cities, but I always have holidays, vacations in the farm with my grandfather. So I can have a, a view of both of sides. And I will try to bring a little bit about these, uh, these challenges that I see. So there are a lot of people uh, living in cities, and this is, uh, the density of the cities is always increasing. There are mega cities, like we see in New York, it's almost 20 million people, like Sao Paulo city. I am from Brazil, it's a huge city. And there are few people in the field that need to produce food for a lot of people that live in the cities. So that's a big challenge that's not so easy to solve. And not only this, the people also demand for cheap food. So always, most of people when go to the supermarket, they want to take the, the, the best offer. So what's the, the cheapest pasta with the best flavor, but the, just few people that really want to realize where that food come from. So for this, this uh, a scientific collaboration with artists and like what we are doing today is very important. So people can reflect better uh, about their decisions in day for in every day. So everybody needs to eat every day, like three times a day. But most of people just do this automatically. No one thinks much about where it comes from. So th this kind of conversation, I think it's very interesting so people can be more aware about what they are eating and to make better options. And uh, another question, it's the food habits in the cities. So I include myself, like every day in the morning we eat bread. So sometimes or usually for some people have pasta at lunchtime, later have pizza and all these products, they come from wheat. So if we billion, billions of people eat wheat products every day, 
it means just industrial farming in the field that can supply all this wheat for, for the people to eat. And the farmers, they just produce what people buy in the cities. So if we change what we eat in the cities, we will have a huge impact in the field and what the farmers will grow. So sometimes we, we make too, much, too many discussions about pollution, about the consequences, like when someone is sick, like if we discuss just the fever, but we don't discuss much the, the causes of this. So if we think in our day-to-day -day decisions, they can make a huge impact about all the system. So these are the challenges um, I want to discuss a little bit. And uh, I see, I am very positive and optimistic. And for sure, there are a lot of possibilities that we can change this kind of situation. So art science collaboration, I think it's a very nice initiative that we can uh, make outreach. We can try to bring the, the information that we have in science for more people. Art is something that touch people and people make the people not just see the information, but also have feelings about the information. So I think it's a, a very, very, very powerful way to, to make people think about uh, the food question, like what we are discussing today. Another question, another possibility, I think is urban gardens. Uh, as you said before, nicely said uh, about, not only about like to produce food, because the quantity that we can produce in urban gardens, they are not as big as the demands that we have nowadays to feed the, all, all the population. But they can make like a very good, uh, a good uh, to people think about better about food and also to connect people. So uh, usually in, in big cities, people are isolated. They live in their our houses or apartments. And when there is a urban garden, people can get together, they can discuss together, and they can have new ideas. And uh, here in Berlin, this is uh, now growing a lot. And I see this is uh, uh, something very beneficial uh, uh, that will help a lot for, for this uh, better agricultural practice. So it's important to know that we ourselves as individuals also we have a lot of power. So you can buy better and more diverse foods in the city and the farmer will produce what you buy in the city. So if you don't eat just bread or, or just pasta or just pizza or just wheat, but we start to eat like different grains, very diverse foods, the farmers will start to do the same in the field. So this nice photo here, this lady has a high diversity of plants. If we compare with the photo before, that was a monoculture of wheat. And this is a reflex of a market. So if she can sell for someone that will buy this, more farmers will follow this. And this is a decision of individuals on, in, on this, in the cities. And uh, an, another topic that I will talk more my scientific field, the research that uh, I do here in Berlin, that's about soil ecological process. So of course, this is a very huge topic. Uh, the, the soil ecological process, uh, for example, earthworms that we nicely heard of about this before, they can improve soil quality and reduce uh, pollution in soil. Uh, for example, just one gram of soil, if you will see this hand here full of soil and roots, one gram is just a small piece of this, this soil here in the hand of this person. And in just one gram of soil, there, there are billions of cells of bacteria and immense diversity of fungi, proteins, animals. More than a million of organisms just in one gram of soil. So this is a super high diversity that if you will take care of this diversity better, we can improve also the, the food production and the plant production. Uh, how can we learn and care about living beings we cannot quickly know or see? For example, if there are this one billion of bacteria in one gram of soil, and most of people don't have no idea that they are there, uh, the first step is like how we do outreach so people will, uh, will have more knowledge about them. So one example is uh, a nice conference that we had here in Berlin uh, with the Art Laboratory. So I had the opportunity to talk about some scientific aspects with like a more easy language. 
So this presentation is in the website. And uh, I'm going to talk from these millions of organisms. I will talk a little bit about two of them. So of course, I will not talk too many uh, details about them. And, but there is this video in the website that someone is curious about. They can uh, have more information about them. So one is the abuscular mycorrhiza fungi. You can see here in this photo that in, in the left side, there is a plant with uh, the roots outside the soil and a lot of white color here around the roots. All this white color, it represents the fungi. And sometimes the fungi can have more biomass, or more, more biomass, no, more height, more uh, area station than the roots itself. So the fungus can bring the, the nutrients to the plants and also to prevent them to, to have problems with the soil pollution. So for example, they can protect the plants from heavy metals that we, we heard a little bit before. And another example, there are some bacteria that they live in the roots of the plants and they can bring nitrogen for the plants. I will talk very fast about them. So uh, these two stories uh, I, I told the, in this event that we made that we have the video in the website. Just to be short, uh, also another topic that we talked here that uh, there is this anthropocentric view of life but we humans on Earth, we live here just from the last 200,000 years. And for example, this symbiosis of this plant with this fungus, it, it's here in, on Earth from 400 million years ago. So it's a lot of time that the nature do this process in a sustainable way. And now we just like in a few years, we want to change all this process. So we, we can learn a lot of nature and we can use this in agriculture to, to make better systems. Another thing that's interesting about this fungus, that it produces these uh, very beautiful spores with different colors, with different shapes. They look a little bit like uh, tissues stones. So some artists are also interesting to try to make some works with this. So there are two points. One is the symbiosis, because the fungus help the plant. And other is the, the, the beauty of the, the, the fungus itself. So basically, in this symbiosis, the, the, plant, the plant takes the energy of the sun, it produces carbohydrates, and transfers this energy to the fungus. And the fungus protect the plant from stress, like soil pollution, and also bring nutrients to plant. So it's a symbiosis that both of them uh, benefit from this. And th th this is uh, this can have a lot of importance for for food production. So uh, uh, almost 85 percent of plants form symbiosis with AMF. It's very important in natural ecosystems. It it, it has a big impact in plant fitness. Uh, it can reduce fertilizer demands in farming system, and it's very important for bio and organic farming. So this is an example of an organism that most of people don't know that they exist, and they can make like a, a lot of uh, good things for us. And the second example is the rhizobia. That's this bacteria that lives in, in the roots of the plants. So there is a big paradox that we, the air that we breathe is mostly denitrogen. We breathe this every time, but we can take this nitrogen to produce proteins. So uh, the only way to do this is by chemical process, like to do it, uh, fertilizers, or the nature do this like by natural process, like in biological nitrogen fixation by bacteria. So this bacteria can take this nitrogen from the air, bring it to the plant, the plant will produce proteins, and we eat the proteins. So it's a very beautiful symbiosis that has also like a very good consequences for human life. There is here a, a small photo from the Sasha website. Sasha was an uh, artist that was uh, in Berlin for a, a, a few time. She visited the art laboratory and also Freie Universität. And she has this very beautiful uh, art that she made with the, the symbiosis. So if someone is curious, can take a look at the website later. It's very nice. So basically, that is this uh, 
paradox that air is rich in nitrogen, but the bacteria can take this nitrogen and transform in ammonium or in nitrate, and then plants or fungi can transform this in proteins, and the, we can use these proteins for our nutrition. It can reduce fertilizer demands in farming system, and the protein in the food you eat, or it comes from biological nitrogen fixation or from nitrogen fertilizers. So we have this example that the soybeans in Brazil, they use zero nitrogen fertilizer. All the nitrogen from so soybeans in, in Brazil, they came from nitrogen uh, uh, fixation. So if you eat your protein from soybeans that came from Brazil, you are taking this nitrogen from a biological process. And that's very nice. That's something that's growing a lot in the US too. So a lot of farms now, they also are starting to use this uh, nitrogen fixation, but uh, uh, some uh, farmers in the US also use the nitrogen fertilizer, fertilizers. And the third question is in actually the summary, what I want to say today. <laughs> so we have uh, what's care like in practice. So I see some challenges that few people in the field need to produce food for a lot of people in the city. So billions of people and it's still growing. The people in the city, they demand for cheap food. Few people in the cities really uh, realize where the food comes from. So I see all, some possibilities of changes and how, how we can help in this process. So art science collaboration, it's a very powerful way that we can bring this information for people like with beautiful art, like Sasha did, or like the conversation that we are doing today, that, that's very nice. And also bring innovative models, like the nice projects from King and uh, Amy, and also Anya that we saw today. These innovative mo models make people think about the what they eat and, and how is food production. Another possibility is urban, urban gardens, that they, they also promote uh, more thinking about this and connect, connection of people. And another thing that uh, I, I was thinking about now that we, we need to do a lot of home office, that everything is online, we have all these online meetings, internet and online connections maybe also may help in this way to reduce the, the density of cities, you know. Because in the past, most of people were moving to cities because the jobs were in the cities. But with the home office and all this connectivity with the internet, we see that that's not really necessary nowadays. So maybe some people can start to move from big cities to countryside again to try to re-equilibrate this, this density of people. And it, of course, this situation with the, the, the virus is very sad, but it also makes some reflections that we can make changes in, in, in society in this in this way that more people go to outside the big cities and we can try to equilibrate, for example, food production with more gardens and urban gardens and uh, people itself reflecting more about this. And also, uh, I think it's very important to think about individual decisions. Usually we think like uh, this is a problem that someone needs to solve, this is a problem that the government needs to do something. But actually, there are a lot of things that us, with, as individuals, we can make difference. So we can buy better and more diverse foods in the city, not just eat wheat in the morning, in the lunch, and later in the evening. And if we change our food habits like for more diverse food, the farmers also will start to produce more diversity in the field. And also, the, the type of food, we know where the food comes from, we can make better decisions to, to buy these this, uh, foods that have better impact in, in the environment. So the farmers will only produce what you buy. So we have a lot of uh, power as, as individuals too. So thank you so much for, for the opportunity and I will be happy to talk more about these topics. Thank you very much, Daniel. Muito obrigado. Great, great. I think we had a, a big journey now, very intense journey with our reflections and uh, contributions from uh, art and science. And uh, there are, um, I guess, 
certain aspects that were occurring for all our and uh, if I can just sum it up that we plunge into the discussion, um, I was struck as we had all, all of our they dealt with a similar I think all our um, our strivings with their different approaches and projects and ideas goes into an interface of Starting uh, from the animal machine interface that I see with these intriguing projects that can um, produ um, produce and uh, introduce us into the future space. Like a, a, a more a balanced ecosystem. Um, I see here. Also, with the projects that um, Amy um, presented to us, with the co-projects uh, co from Amy and Ken, uh, which actually also all follow the question of how can we make um, uh, it easier to feed ourselves and feed um, and go into a coexistence uh, of a um, interspe multi-species coexistence. And uh, Lynn Magulis, especially in the forefront of all our thoughts. And what I found very noteworthy, also, Amy, that you talked about an ethic belonging. Maybe we can discuss also about that uh, later on. With uh, very impressive examples of the sustainable closed circuits, I think the sustainability we can also discuss in a little while. Um, and with all the um, examples that Anna brought uh, to us today, uh, with an interface and the um, collaboration, the multidisciplinary collaboration of art and science that we are all connected here, um, um, all the speakers. And uh, in the example of New York and the Swale House, et cetera, and also the topic of citizen science. And I think finally also that uh, connected very much to what Daniel said. Um, Maybe I just do not want to come to a conclusion, but maybe to something that helps us to jump into our uh, collective discussion. Uh, I think we all touched uh, the need for multidisciplinary action, the need to leave our niche of uh, specialhood and to, uh, lead, to leave our um, human-centered uh, worldview and uh, life, uh, how we, we traditionally, how we would uh, lead it. So the awareness um, and the uh, lack of holistic approach, I think that leads us actually to more uh, DIY or DIWO, as we said already earlier, the do it with others actions. So maybe to open up a discussion, and I know probably all of us here and all of you speaking here, you probably have your own questions and, 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 and aspects, but maybe we can actually start with uh, thinking about the accessibility. It's uh, the biopolitical accessibility, and ethic accessibility, um, economic accessibility, for creating more sustainable uh, food, food um, um, uh, environments. So if you want, you can unmute, everyone can unmute yourself and uh, maybe we can start to, to, to discuss from that. But please don't feel um, uh, close by and uh, of course, please put your questions as well to one another. I guess one of the things that um, that is on my mind after hearing everybody speak is um, is who's who's missing in this conversation. And in some ways, we get a, a hint of that from hearing about Anya and Danielle's past of having kind of farming um, agricultural experiences that um, that I don't have. <laughs> and you know, and I wonder, you know, um, should you know, sort of like the feels like what we're missing, we have these sort of local style city experiences happening. You know, Daniel presented to us these kind of high scale agricultural situations of having to cities. Um, where is all of the in between of that? You know, like where are the places where we as, um, 
as people, not even just as artists, but as eaters, <laughs> where, where can we as eaters get those experiences, um, like practical experiences of, of caring and tending for um, food on a farm, even though we're all busy, but you know, are there citizen eating residencies that could be created? You know, like what can we build that would bridge that gap? Um, and be an interface, in a sense, between the, the urban and the um, rural. That's a very interesting uh, point. I, I know like there are a lot of farmers that uh, accept volunteers and the interns because some of my students uh, even apply to do it. It's not even that easy to get the experience. And there are lots of programs like, around the world which I find very interesting. Um, and, I think that it's a lot of cultural things in this uh, in this conversation because what is uh, something uh, so cool and fascinating for urban people uh, for someone who grew up in the countryside, especially like in Russia, we we are very uh, gardening people, like farmers, and it's it's really a, a part of culture. So for us to grow our own produce is a part of our lifestyle. Something that you're doing like like brushing your teeth and uh, not something you would uh, you know have an extra uh, step to, to find so I, I found it very fascinating um, and um, also found very interesting that people in New York have community gardens which I also did not see before when I came first at, and I saw it in Brooklyn like in Coney Island I was like why people are growing food in the city when there is so much food in stores and only through this like college experience when i started working in the laboratory and engaged um, with the community gardeners i understood that it's not just about the food but it's about connections and experiences and it's really even decreases the like, criminal activities in cities in neighborhoods where there's some gardens and green space where people work and they have this uh, connection so it's quite fascinating but coming back to this um, uh, original question about the accessibility and uh, all this, like really how we make it sustainable, from a practical point of view, from my daughter of a farmer, I know it is hard for people, for farmers to adapt to the sustainable practices. One is, uh, you know, the government regimes, like different cultural practices. One, another one is that it's uh, mandatory. People to move from uh, traditional practices to sustainable practices. Uh, it takes a um, lot of energy and money, uh, resources. And uh, a lot of farmers would rather feed their families uh, with what they produce, the way they produce, than thinking if it's what they grow and how they grow sustainable or not. So it's a changing uh, of um, like paradigm shift in the way people think. Uh, through the knowledge and education, but another one, even if they want to do it, like they need resources to do it. And simply it's just like, you know, till no till technology, they need the uh, equipment for that. And not every farmer would have it because it's really expensive. And like in small farmers, uh, it's harder to do uh, to the sustainable practices than larger farmer, like corporations who have resources. And I, I've been to actually Brazil a couple of years ago for International uh, Soul Congress, and they took us uh, to uh, Rondonia. It's a very agricultural state, it's, uh, part of Am Amazon region. I didn't see much of Amazon. It was more of a, <laughs> a, a Cerrado, just like uh, grasslands, which I I was really uh, amazed to see and compare this like practices between like Russia and Brazil, which are really huge uh, uh, farm countries. Um, but what they brought up indeed is what Daniel was saying, how uh, sustainable they become because they have um, ability to grow three harvests per year and they have the crop rotation with yield, with, uh, not yield, uh, with soybeans that uh, brings a symbiotic relationship with bacteria and they can uh, do this natural fertilization. They also do lots of uh, fungi uh, that can help to mine for other minerals from the soil. So they were able to transition that. Uh, but it's very hard to do in other climates when we don't have this crop rotation. And the crop rotation will be based on like every year rather than three times a year. Then people, uh, farmers will lose money by not growing it every year, their harvest, right? If they cannot grow wheat every year, they need to um, like basically lose a year to gain this. Uh, so... 
it's uh, one thing is for us to just like think about sustainability and tell this is what we all should do. But another thing, it's it's really hard because uh, it's all come back to technologies and uh, funding for farmers. So we had somehow more subsidized subsidies for farmers uh, to help them to transition, get like new technology, new practices then it would uh, be more impactful. An urban scale indeed, as also Daniel um, highlighted, it's very, very small. And um, although like it's great to do these things, but it cannot feed the city, right? So it comes back to the big farms and big corporations and it's, uh, they would require real resources to, ch to change. So we definitely missing farmers in this conversation and see more of their perspective and their challenges. Um, what they need, really, we need to talk to them and see what they need, how we can make it better. I was gonna say that in this conversation, thank you all for these questions, there seems to be a distinct challenge between thinking about feeding a city and the machines that we make to harvest, in particular, the technologies that are produced are optimized for hybrid forms of corn and wheat. For me, this is very much driving the conversation. In other words, it's the machine, it is the tractor, it is the factory farms, it is the hybridization of fruits and vegetables that are driving the conversation toward factory farming. So in a way, I think that we're talking about slow food maybe, maybe we're talking about permaculture or the 11 varieties of corn that might come out of the original Mayan culture we're talking about emphasizing care and, um, and, and direct action versus the machine touching a bunch of our food because it requires the hungry or requires to be, feed the 20 million people in Sao Paulo or the uh, 10 million people in New York City or in Berlin. So for me, a lot of the conversation is really around the kind of the way technology is driving the conversation basically surrounding issues of world overpopulation. And the only way we're rescuing ourselves currently is fertilizers, pesticides, and machines, because it's the only way we really have figured out how to feed ourselves. So for me, this is one of the really central big problems, which is how do we separate our current practices of machines as they drive agriculture and hybridization of seeds and or pesticides as they're all kind of unified now, and it's difficult to untangle this space. Yeah. In the middle of the new machines, um, I was thinking of another artist, Catherine Godea Brown, who works with farming communities in Mexico, and uh, she was very interested in these villages that still have the milpa, which is this traditional field where they grow the maize, the uh, uh, squash, and beans together. Love and it. they're actually produce more maize uh, than a factory, than a, than a industrial field, uh, but you can't run a combine for it. It has to be hand-picked. So maybe, yeah. maybe creating new robots, new machines could make that viable, which would be an interesting thing. Uh, I mean, her, uh, ironically, her result is that uh, with another collective, they found other ways where these villages make milpas for subsistence, but then uh, roll agave and then uh, market, uh, she helps to arrange market uh, uh, premium tequila. So that the, the village survives from that uh, economically, the traditional agriculture, uh, you know, their urban rural compromise. I was just wondering, you know, exactly like bringing people into the act of making things uh, makes them more aware. I grew up with a garden in the countryside and in the 1970s and everything was about, you know, chemical fertilizers, pesticides and so on. And, you know, it's never, never really about the microbiology of, of gardening or plants. And, but maybe, you know, that study of urban gardening or agriculture, but also even things like fermentation, make people aware of the kind of microbiological complexity and the idea would be it would make more choosy consumers, but then also factory food has also been created in our, our taste buds and also our nutritional standards for the last 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I okay. have to unmute you? 
We can't hear you, Daniel. Still can't hear you. Can you try again? Oh, no. It was Chris probably saying. I wonder um, maybe to maybe to connect and reconnect, do you think? Or I don't know. Uh, Daniel, maybe? Or? We jump out and come back. Yeah, you want to quickly jump out from the Zoom and come back? Strange. I think he doesn't hear us too. Sorry, Daniel, I cannot hear you. Maybe leave the Zoom chat and you come back. Talking about technological challenges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talking about big machinery, if, there is, if we have a problem with little Zoom. <laughs> sure, we can also continue and then when Daniel come, comes back and we come. I'll just put this out there. Yeah. This is on my mind um, after what Chris was saying and thinking about. Um, of this being aware of microbial diversity and things that we are um, weren't aware of and now are aware of things like mycorrhiza that um, that I think we need um, micro petting zoos instead of like you go to the farm and you pet the sheep I think we need sort of like lab micro petting zoos with you know community gardens on the outskirts of the city maybe like in the suburbs so I'll just put <laughs> well, I was going to say that what's so interesting to me about our microbiomes is that much of the food we actually absorb through our stomachs is actually the waste product of the bacteria eating the food they can eat, which we cannot digest. So obviously we have a very profound symbiotic relationship, but the interesting thing is that they're actually communicating with the neurotransmitters in our stomach and producing GABA, which makes us happy. So it's like, there is a real distinct relationship, not only between consuming food, but between the neuro signaling happening inside our bodies. And that's the best petting zoo I could imagine, which is to pet the bacteria in my tummy as I'm digesting and they're digesting and we're all happy together with our GABA and neurotransmitters. So, sorry, Daniel, you're- Yeah, I am back. Yes. Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes, I yeah, can hear you very well. Problem with my computer, I guess. Yes, yeah, so uh, about the question before, I have a little bit different opinion. Uh, I, I don't think that technology that drives the, the food production, but technology is a conse consequence of, of the, our society. So I see this because my farmer, my farmer, my, my grandfather himself was a farmer and he produced organic for several years. And the, the technology, it came together with the population growth and the demands of people for cheaper food. So there was a point that he realized that he was unable to produce organic anymore because he had a, a small farm and he will not produce enough to, to sell to pay off the bills. So uh, nowadays we have a society that don't care much about what they eat usually when you go to supermarket you want to eat like cheap food for other people they don't have option unfortunately they need to buy the cheapest because they don't have much money available and this drives technology so technology tries to solve this problem so i don't think the technology itself makes the the, the problems but the way that we structure the the our society uh, people they pay a lot for rent so housing here in, in Berlin for me it's super expensive and people want to, sp to spend a lot to, to, to live in a good neighborhood, but they go to a cheap supermarket to buy food. So people don't do the opposite, okay? So I will 
live a little bit more far from the city in a cheaper uh, uh, neighborhood, but I will buy better food with better price that I will pay for the farmer to do a better service. And this comes together with what he, uh, Anya said before, like, I don't think like the government need to pay the farmers to produce organic to solve the problems, you know. This is something that we can do like people, like instead of save a lot of money to buy the newest cell phone or the newest car or like the best apartment in the best neighborhood, if we start to use a little bit of the our money to pay for the farmers that they do good practices, the other farmers will follow that, you know. I know that there are a lot of these cultural barriers for sure. It's difficult for farmers to change for, for one production system for the next. He, he just will do this if he feels like this will make his life safer. For sure, no farmer will like, ah, I will start to produce organic. That's very complicated for a farmer to change from conventional to organic. It needs five years transition time that they, he needs to sell his product for normal conventional pr price. So he doesn't pay his bills for five years. And in five years, he doesn't know if the market will be there to pay for that pri good price for him. So this transition, it's a little complicated. And I think it's very connected with the decision of people in the cities. If you spend less money, like in, in the best smartphone, in the best TV with like the new 8K resolution, you know, like I, I saw a, a paper these days, these days that like our eyes can see just 4K. So the companies want us now to say, to sell like 8K, 16K, but maybe we don't need that. And we don't use this same uh, way to think about food. Like, okay, I will buy a food that comes from a farmer that uses better practice in the field, you know. I will pay him to do that good service for myself. So we want like cheap price and the, he, he will not uh, solve this problems without having this uh, consumer's side to, to help the production. And the technology comes as consequence. If more people want to eat organic, we will start to produce technology to produce organic. The, the, the point, like most of people don't care if it's organic or not. So why companies or why scientists will make uh, technology for that if there is no demand? So even the big companies, uh, some of them, they, are, they have now new breeding programs to select seeds that grow better in organic. Because for example, here in Berlin, it's a big market. So the, the big companies, they follow this. If the consumers want that product, they will make top technology to deliver that product. So I think it's more in the level of the consumers. If we change the way that we buy, the farmers will follow this too. I, I see a little bit by the experience that, that I have in my family itself, because it was impossible to follow organic farming if there was no difference like in, in the price or in the demand by, by the big cities. Uh, and, and about the symbiosis, I, I agree completely with you. Uh, Aristotle, he used to say that the plants have a gut that's the opposite of humans. We digest our food inside our guts and the plants like they have the roots that the guts is outside in the soil. And there is a huge also biota microbiota that lives in the root of plants and help the plants to take these nutrients from the soil. So it's very nice to make this parallel, like not only the microorganisms inside of our guts, but also within the plants, they also produce these very beneficial uh, services to, to improve plant growth. This is, this is so interesting. I think uh, all of our contributions today bring us again to sort of a symbiotic coexistence. And um, maybe at that point, I actually would like to ask uh, Amy and Ken also, can you tell us more, as I think also in our discussion that we see it is all about accessibility, it's all about knowledge and awareness. And uh, it's, it's obviously ways that we have to find and, um, edit and, and develop to grow the awareness, but then also the education. I think it all ends up with education and um, what we can achieve and uh, for a mass of people and not uh, for 
a selected uh, group of, um, uh, of uh, outside club. So I'd like actually to come back to uh, Amy and uh, Ken's projects uh, that you um, presented today and the accessibility and um, uh, how can we reproduce uh, your works kind of like to, to bring a sort of a whole closed circuit system home to our homes and also the idea of technological equipment and uh, the digital accessibility in a way of a sort of a recipe or production mode that you offer us. Can you tell us a little bit more how accessible these projects can be? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start, Amy, or shall I? Um, go ahead. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. I, I totally agree. I think education is really an important factor and I completely celebrate and love what you're all doing at Art Lab Berlin and bringing people together and fostering these very important uh, conversations. I think it is really all about education and, and making it real for the viewer or the participant, if you will, exactly what it is we're talking about. And that could be uh, making uh, back, the awareness that bacteria lives and fungi live and exist on money available to people via visual arts and the arts do that, I think. But in terms of our farm fountain and what Amy and I were working to achieve in some of our works with urban agriculture, we experience, we feel a lot of success, but we also feel that it, it, it basically had a lot of failures, which in a way we feel is very much a part of contemporary art and agriculture. But, you know, the challenge for us with the farm fountain, it was incredibly difficult to maintain. Um, fruit flies entered our house. We actually took out a wall in our house and made a green pantry. We loved growing tilapia, but the truth is, is it was very difficult to harvest fish because the fish for us became pets. It was difficult to look in the eyes of the fish and know it was going to be food, but to realize that at the same time we raised it as a pet. And I'm going to venture a guess that for both Daniel and Anya and others who have raised animals from, from, from you know, young beings, we, we love these animals. We don't want to eat them, but there is a certain point at which they become food. So I think that there are a lot of challenges in urban agriculture, which is, are we going to take responsibility for killing the animals if we eat meat, for example, that we, we raise ourselves? And where are we looking and what kind of ethics are we actually showing? Are we being humane or inhumane? I think that as long as we create humane environments for animals that give them a good life, then to me, that's the best we could do as a species because everything needs to eat. Uh, yeah, and I guess going further with um, the idea of education. You know, it's something that we do as university professors and um, we try to engage our students in projects that try to, try to amplify um, the mycorrhizal connections and things like that um, have happened in my classes with my students um, in these kinds of group project building ways, but um, I guess I'm also thinking, so that's one, I think we need to think on multiple levels about education. So, you know, there's the educating that I get to do myself, with myself, with these organisms and with Ken um, in our home. And we learn a lot from living with these organisms. And I feel educated by them in an embodied way. But I, and I, and I hope that my students get that experience too. But, I think I also, you know, in my other question earlier about, um, you know, where's this interface, I feel like um, we as urban people need to be in a kind of more regular relationship with educating ourselves about food systems. Like, I would really love to, you know, once a month go to a farm and work on the farm and be educated about where the food that I buying at the grocery store is coming from. Like, I would like that experience. I would like more people to have that experience because we're learning from farm systems, but we're also learning from the organization, organisms there. And potentially, um, we're also bringing some, something else to the farm people. Like, like, there's an exchange where we're all educating each other, potentially, in my mind. Okay. Well, I agree with you. I, I made some of my relatives to do compost, you know, 
because it's not very common practice. Like it's common for like New York and California in the states, like you know, big uh, states, uh, but not uh, in some some smaller places. So in uh, in Russia, composting is still a new thing, and uh, we well we use like manure composting as a part of like practices always, but not like plant composting and food scraps. So that is something. And then now uh, this year they're having some, you know, plants growing and it's like, oh my God, look at my potatoes, controlled versus composted. <laughs> so it definitely it is exchange um, between what we know from the science perspective and then what they're actually doing. So uh, more collaborations uh, or more just conversations with them uh, will be beneficial for both sides. I'd like to bring in the public, and uh, we have had several comments, and I'd like to read um, a public question, and I think it also is going to any moment to everyone. So someone is writing here, I'm curious to hear all of your thoughts about the potential for projects where the human is not present at all, either as a primary actor or as the recipient beneficiary of interspecies interactions. So, and directly to Amy, someone is writing, is the system more equitable if the non-human survival is still dependent on human care? Good question. And when the humans are replaceable, as is the case with earthworms. The person adds, not that the person thinks that it's true, it's just what the hardware store tells. So this is actually an interesting aspect also to consider this, talking about decentering the humans. Uh, what could we say to that? Um, I guess, I guess we're we're self-focused, right? And I don't I don't know um, I don't know who would get to decide what was more equitable, <laughs> like equitable for whom is always the question. So, you know, since we are concerned with our own eating and our own survival. Um, I, I guess it's just about survival and I don't know if it's, um, if it's easy for me to say whether or not what's more equitable. If we're still dependent on human care, um, yeah, and I'm not sure how to respond to that honestly, but, um, but obviously, you know, the decentering questions are very interesting to me and certainly if humans are not a part of the picture, as we often are not, everything's great. Like, and there's no, I don't have a problem with humans not being a part of the system because that often happens. I think we're just focused on the systems that we are a part of because we're reliant on them and they involve us. Um, so within those systems that we are involved with, it seems like um, we can, at least try to take the perspective of the other organisms that we're in community with. So in a, in a way, elevating the other organisms to um, the sense of community that we always um, have for ourselves. You know, what if we um, participated as citizens in the community is more where I'm going with. The communities that we're not already a part of, maybe we should stay out of. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, the, the Earth will regenerate itself. They, you know, from ecological point of view, the planet will always uh, take back and like, regrow, reestablish itself, and like it's always changes its dynamic. So the we are more dependent on resource on the planet than than any natural system depends on us. We are really just in a like small piece out of the whole system and sometimes you're right like we are just centralized ourselves focus too much but the planet is the planet look what's happening now and like you know it's, it's regenerating itself for us where people are less um in the system when it's just cleaner air cleaner earth one of the other real issues that i think we could perhaps talk about is the fact that um, most humans at this point are living in cities and cities are not farms and other than maybe urban agriculture there's not a lot of land to feed the whole city so to me a lot of the kind of questions we're, we're wrestling with are about where do people live what do they do with their time 
how do they, for example, think about urban agriculture if they're living on the 50th floor of an apartment building? Is there an option there for something or some kind of contribution to a farm system? There's, you know, a really great book by Ken Yang, basically, you know, and Ken basically says that he believes that humans need to live in cities because that's going to allow land to exist in its natural states for other animals to feed themselves. Currently, of course, we're over farming everything, including the oceans. And that's one of the very early reasons that Amy and I pursued the farm fountain. We know now that, well, our project was in 2008 and we were greatly honored to receive a, a, a United Nations um, award for that project because it was genuinely about feeding people in urban environments and empowering people to make their own food. But I think some of the real questions are is where will we live? And then based on where we live, how, we, how will we feed ourselves? And then based on how we feed ourselves, can we use soil in cities? Or will aquaponics be a new form, especially an informed aquaponics that thinks about bacterial or denitrifying bacteria, for example? Um, and to me, those are some of the central issues because people have chosen to live in cities. We can't all afford to live in the countryside. We know oil is supporting that ability with roads. So to me, those are some of the other central systemic issues we need to think about, which is where do we live? And based on that, how will we farm and how will we feed ourselves? We have another public uh, comment. Raphael Morel writes, believe that the rethinking of the way of life and relationship with food is necessary because over time people have lost that relationship. He says, in Brazil, the movement to return to the countryside is happening and in cities like uh, Rio de Janeiro, urban agriculture gains strength. And actually, even in Moscow, like even though like we are like very uh, culturally, you know, like uh, clean um, gardening people, but like in, people don't do it like community gardens in Moscow, like cities. But now it is coming there as well. So look at the same about Rio. I actually had a conversation with someone recently as well from Brazil. This yeah, the saying is so. So because like people don't get chance to work, uh, as Ken just said, in in guard in gardens like any urban farming. Uh, but it is coming because people want to do something with their free time, at least uh, just like for kids, because like all the generation understand what it's like, where the food is coming from. But the kids, sometimes they don't know, they think the food is coming from the store and they don't know how the cow look like. <laughs> so then it's really important for them to have these excursions to uh, outside of outside of the city or maybe inside of the city but they have these interactions and we find through our like workshops that the kids are really love it and it's for them it's it's really interesting engaging it's like it's new form and sometimes we had even like soil parties because like parents would get uh some of my colleagues did that and they were just like playing with kids playing with dirt and it's i guess maybe it's another way of artistic engagement way for kids to be um uh, to be educated through that by having um, like playing with dirt and doing something with it and uh, uh, that's how we change the perspective for future because it's hard to change all the generations like ourselves it's hard to change right but we can educate uh, the future one so they think differently from us more issues more questions here i would like um, to just something really quickly. It says, with the ever so rapid population growth rates, it is expected that arable land per person will drop by 66% in 2050 in comparison to 1970. Vertical farms allow for, in some cases, over 10 times the crop yield per acre than traditional methods. I would ask this group, given the world population, can we afford to use soil to grow for 9 billion or 18 billion people. Yeah, but then like it's, uh, we can grow some things in vertical farming, but can we grow everything in it? Probably not. But you know, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, I am, given that much of the world population or a lot of the world population, what is it, one out of eight is, you know, food insecure. We're currently not feeding the planet, but we know about the big dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and many dead zones around the world. We're killing the oceans, we're extractivist in our policy. So to me, these are the real questions, like how do we feed everybody and what, what are those methods? 
Mm -hmm. Another comment question maybe uh, for, uh, for Anna and Daniel. Uh, and Jackson sees the tension uh, between actions of individuals in art and urban agriculture as a uh, way for individuals to rediscover their agency and feel empowered, empowered about food choices versus the ne uh, necessary scales of food production now in the future. But how can urban dwellers evaluate alternative agroecological systems as a source of food and other ecosystem services? Love it. Yeah, very educational, like this one is, is very informative. Like growing uh, oyster mushrooms? We, Amy and I just started doing that in our home, and oh my, they are delicious. Oh my god, I was impressed by your warm composting establishment. It's just, <laughs> I heard people are doing warm composting under their beds, but not like in the table. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree with this comment that we need to think how to rethink our relationship with food. And th this is very connected with this last question, you know, because it, it, it comes also with the, what you talked about education. Uh, the, the education system itself should discuss food since we are kids, you know. We go to the kids, we have the meal there, and we discuss little about what we are eating. And this is something that we as humans, we need to do every time. We can't survive without food, but no one really just dis discuss where the food comes from and what's the best way to do this, what are the future. So someone also made this comment about uh, to have some systems without humans producing foods. I think it's possible that we have more machines making the, the, the service but the, always we will need to have some human to make decisions. So to decisions what we are going to eat, like or what we are going to choose. And the, the, all this start with these discussions with education, you know, more people discussing this, what they want, and how are the systems that we, we really want to, to live with. Uh, what we are doing now is, for most of people, it's like automatic, automatic system. We wake up in the morning, we take our bread, we go to the lunch, we eat something, and no one really thinks about this, you know. I think it's not a decision that, like, an individual should have, but it's a very complex uh, question that relies our existence, you know. We don't live without food. This is our most basic need for existence. And this is something that people talk little. It's like, for me, it's such a big paradox that something so important and we talk little about this. And more people discussing this and having ideas, I think we can make a, a real future about like a, what's the, 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 our best connection with food. And I agree also with this uh, uh, urban garden uh, movement. Uh, I don't think like someone said out, oh, uh, this vertical farming in one hectare, we have like much more food. I agree with Anya that we can't produce everything with this vertical farm. Like we can have maybe seven times more production of lettuce or tomato, but just a few vegetables that we can grow like this. And people, of course, we will not eat like lettuce every day or tomatoes every day. We need all step foods and energy. And this comes from, from my more complex systems that was need to have large areas. We need to combine both together. I think that there is no solution like let's do one thing or other thing, but like how we, we talk as society in different science field, fields, in different society fields, to have like better decisions and better possibilities. It's more like a idea of uh, like gardening in the urban environments. Of some, of course, it adds it helps to the grocery bill. It reduces, uh, you know, consumption from the store if they can grow something. Uh, but it's more for educational. I feel like it's more about awareness, more about yeah. getting the skill and just be familiar with this concept. Uh, and it's not going to fit completely, but it's a, it's the, 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 the chain between this and this and it helps for people to connect the larger systems and understand how it works. And at least to do something rather than nothing. And uh, to grow your own tomato plant in a, in a pot, it's still uh, at least, you know, even for a kid, it's fun to, to see how uh, roots are growing, how 
it see it is germinating, and then hopefully that will help them to um, rethink and think differently because they observe at least on a small scale what is happening. So it's it's like a connection between uh, other systems. That's how I see it. So. Yeah, I agree completely with you, Anya. And this is why I think this work of Kim and Amy are very nice, the, the work of Anya too, because it, it makes people think about this, you know. Uh, the, the, the biggest challenge, most of people are in automatic mode, mode, you know. We are just like eating every day without thinking about food and where it comes from. So this work that you do, like you uniting together science and art at the same time, it, it brings a lot of insights for people think about. And I agree completely with you, Anja, that the, 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 everything starts with education, you know. So the urban gardens are, are a place that people are discussing these things. So maybe they can start to think, okay, we are doing this in urban gardens. Now maybe we can visit some farms to see how is the reality in the farms, you know. And this is something that also is expanding. Uh, this farming tourist, uh, it's, it's expanding a lot. There are people that from the cities that they want to spend like one week in a farm to see how is the life there and, and to start to think about this. So th this, I think the, this work from King, Amy, Amy, they are very nice to, to make people think about these, these, these questions. Yeah, because otherwise they won't know they need to know it, like, right? Like how, if you don't think about how we know, we need to think about it. So it's like a paradox. But then when we see it, it's like, wait, I never thought of this before. And it's like, what's that? Let me see. Yeah, so it definitely brings uh, attention and then uh, people start to wonder. Even if it's a question and they don't know the answer, the question will stick to their minds like, and it, it will come back. The more they see, the more, you know, how our brains work. The more we see, the more we'll start, start wondering. And then it's like, yeah, it's, it's a new norm if we see it everywhere. So little by little, it'll make a difference. Um, I'm just... Uh seeing the time running and it's already um, after 6 p.m. Berlin time. I would suggest that maybe we um, come to an end about uh, the public viewing and the public streaming. Maybe the six of us, we can still stay together, but maybe for the audience, um, I might actually maybe come uh, to a closure and to an end. And um, so uh, I want to thank also our audience and uh, that were just uh, one of um, many uh, commentaries and uh, um, uh, partaking uh, expressions of uh, the audience uh, internationally. So thank you for um, everyone out there on this planet to follow our conversation. And uh, then of course, I want to thank so much um, Amy, Ken, Anna and Danielle for your time, for your engagement, to share uh, uh, the knowledge and uh, the really amazing projects and methodologies and thoughts and research that you're doing with us. Um, that was uh, really, really uh, treasurable. Thank you so much. Um, I guess what we can take um, from today's meeting is um, uh, raising the awareness on a multidisciplinary level um, uh, going and uh, challenge uh, the um, a big effort of um, doing together and uh, more than human entanglements and um, actually to uh, to be courageous to step out of a um, human centered world and uh, also a challenge um, raising knowledge and sharing with others. I think this is probably a lesson that we could learn today, um, apart from these many, many um, amazing projects. And also the urban grow bags is probably something that I will also research more. And uh, everyone out there, uh, the audience, uh, feel free to, um, to wander around uh, on all um, websites uh, from uh, the participants here today. Uh, if you have more questions or want to come into contact with one of the speakers, uh, feel um, free to uh, send us an email, of course. So uh, maybe right now, please, the speakers stay with us, but maybe we come yeah. and uh, close the, um, the live stream. And I hope we're going to meet you soon, everyone out there. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh. Hey.